powerful. As a means of reminder this morning, I would like for us to consider together a description that Paul, the Apostle Paul, gives of the Lord Jesus in relation to the church, Jesus' relationship with the church. And as I say this, I'm thinking about the description that Paul writes in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22, he's speaking of what the Father has done for Jesus here. But he writes there, and he put all things under his feet. He said, the Father put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. The Father in heaven has made Jesus, the Son, to be head over all things pertaining to the church. Jesus is the head of the church. In pondering this description that Paul gives recently, I, I took note of the fact that there's a couple of different ways that we sometimes use the word head. We would use the word head in what I call a, a leadership sense oftentimes. And by that, I mean that we would use that term to describe a person who leads an organization, for example. Uh, in Nashville, the governor is the head of state government, or at least the head of the executive branch of state government. A few miles up the road from here in Knoxville, Jeremy Pruitt is the head of the football program at the University of Tennessee. He heads up that organization. So it is not uncommon for us to use the term head in that sense. But of course, the more basic and fundamental, and I suppose original definition of the word head has to do with biology or anatomy. The head is a part of the body. In fact, as far as I know, the head is probably the most singularly vital part of the body, the command center of the body, if you will. And from that, I think we can see how it is that we have come to use the term in that other sense as well. We will refer to the leader of an organization as the head because we have come to understand that the human head pretty well runs the body, does it not? And in speaking of Jesus there at the end of Ephesians chapter 1, Paul really makes use of the term in both senses. He's described as the head, the leader of the church in verse 22. But then, of course, in verse 23, Paul compares the Lord's relationship to the church in that regard with that of the human head to the human body. Jesus is the head, and the church is the body that goes with that head. Like the human body, with all its various members, we have hands and feet and, and eyes and things like that. Like the human body, with all its various members, the church is the spiritual body through which our head carries out his intents and purposes in the world. You know, I might come up with an idea to build something in my head, but then I would use the members of my body to carry out that purpose. And I think there's a bit of a parallel there. The Lord, the head has decided that the church will carry out much of his purposes in this world. He is the head, though. He is the only head. You know, we understand that one head goes with one body, do we not? It's very strange to see a creature with one head and two bodies, isn't it? And it's very strange to see a creature with one body and two heads, or more, isn't it? If we see an animal, or sometimes even a human being, who has two heads... <clears throat> Well, we know something's wrong. Something has gone wrong with the development of that, that body along with that head. Jesus is described by the scriptures as the only head that the church has. And that description of him is, is to me, pretty loaded. It's pretty significant. It speaks to us of the importance that he and his will should carry for all of us within the church. And this morning, I want to submit to you that it suggests a few things that we should remember about him. A few things that we should remember about ourselves as the church in relation to him. Our collective relationship to him, we might say. For the next few minutes, I just want to share with you three things that Jesus' title as head of the church should remind us. And the first thing that I would submit in this regard is that as the head of the church, 
Jesus is the ultimate authority within the church. In the human body, every other part of the body answers to the head and acts in accordance with the wishes that emanate from the head. And of course, as I look over this particular audience, I know that most of you are probably aware of the words of Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. Uh, at the time he gave the great commission just before he returned to heaven, remember he stated, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And in the context of our study this morning, there's a couple of things that I would take note of about that statement. And the first thing is that it would certainly mean that Jesus has all authority in the church. Now he says I have all authority in all things. Well, all things would include the church, would it not? So if you've got authority over everything in heaven and on earth, that pretty well covers the church along with everything else. The second thing that I'll take note of about this statement is the fact that the statement doesn't leave room for anyone else to hold any authority in this regard. Now I've asked this question before, but if Jesus has all authority, all, how much does that leave for anyone else? It leaves none. Jesus holds all authority. All authority within the church resides with him. Now I will note that the term that is used there in Matthew 28, 18 for authority, uh, that term ecclesia that we talked about before, that's a term that is used several places in the scripture, and it does allow for the delegation of authority as the holder or possessor of the authority might see fit. And we see this in many organizations uh, where the head of an organization will delegate certain authorities over certain activities to one or more of his subordinates. Think you can get it out. Uh, Mr. Pruitt up in Tennessee, he delegates authority to certain assistant coaches, does he not? And they will have like a defensive coordinator and an offensive coordinator. He delegates certain duties to them that they are to carry out. But what they do in their position must be in accordance with the head's desire. The defensive coordinator can do what the head coach wants him to do, well, he can be replaced. Because even with their delegated authority, they still answer to the head. And as it happens, yes, even the Lord Jesus himself has delegated some authority to others, both in the past and, I believe, in the present as well. Certainly we know that in the first century, the apostles were delegated and given a certain measure of authority within the church. Remember how that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19 that they would be binding and loosing. But you might also note that what they were binding and what they were loosing was what would have already been bound in heaven. They still answered to the Lord, to their head. Whatever authority they had within the church, they still were not to contradict heaven's, Jesus' authority. And even in the present day, really down through the ages, Jesus has delegated a certain amount of authority in this world to the governing authorities. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, Paul writes that we are to be subject to the governing authorities. And he goes on to say that this is because there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So he's delegated some authority uh, in that regard to certain authorities are. But if you continue reading through that passage in Romans chapter 13, you do find that God has some expectations for those who sit in positions of authority. Things that he expects them to do. And they are expected to meet those expectations or they too can be replaced. Remember what Daniel said to King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4 verse 32? He said, the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. So again, there is authority there now when it has been delegated by the Lord, but he still holds the power to withdraw that authority from one and give it to someone else if he so desires. And even within the church, even today, I believe there's a certain amount of authority that's given to leaders within the church according to 1 Peter chapter 5, for example. Elders are giving authority and really strong here and responsibility to shepherd the church where they are at. And that role and the command given to them in that role does, I believe, imply a certain amount of delegated authority from the Lord, as 
as does the Hebrew writer's statement in Hebrews 13 and 17, where he knows that they rule over the church in this sense that we're talking about. But if you look at that passage in 1 Peter 5 that I just mentioned, in 1 Peter 5 and verse 4, the apostle there, Peter, who himself served as an elder of the church, he does speak of the chief shepherd, does he not? He knows that there is a chief shepherd that all of these local shepherds answer to as well. Again, authority has been delegated, but those to whom it has been delegated are still answerable to the one who delegated it to them, to the head of the church, from whom all such authority flows. The fact is, I would like to think that everyone in this audience would know this, but there's nobody on earth who doesn't answer to somebody. Now, we're all probably aware that there are a lot of people in this world who think that they don't answer to anybody, but they're wrong. We all have someone who's head over us. I think of Paul's verse of the Corinthian room. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 3, where he knows that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. If you're not God, then you answer to somebody. In the church, the source of all authority is the Lord Jesus. And so Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of, and the phrase that literally means by the authority of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, my Jesus statement in Matthew 28, this statement in Colossians 3 covers every aspect of life, I believe. But certainly that would include the church then. The church is to have authority from the Lord Jesus for whatever it does. How do we determine that part? How do we find out if something that we may aspire to do as a church is authorized or not? Well, through the source document for our point. Through the written word. In John chapter 16, remember, just before Jesus was crucified, he told the apostles, I've still got more to teach you. And he told them that he would send the Holy Spirit to continue their teaching, to guide them into all truth, truth that they will share with the rest of the world. And in fact, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, Paul, who had become an apostle himself, Paul writes that, yes, he received what he did through Revelation, but he says in these verses that we, all of us, are able to understand his knowledge of the mystery of Christ when we read, when we read what has been written. Those things that the apostles bound and loose, those teachings and practices that Holy Spirit guided men and had the earliest Christians doing, they are preserved for us in the pages of Scripture so that we may know what we ought to be doing as individuals and collectively as the church. And so this is how we establish whether or not what we are doing has the sanction of Jesus. Has his authority behind it? We look to the Word. And this matters. It is so very important that all that we do does have the sanction of Jesus because he is the rightful head of the church from whom such all, all such authority flows. And as such, he directs the proper activities and actions of the church, what the church ought to be doing. There's a lot of scriptures here. We're not going to look at every reference there, but I, I like to, if, if I can mention a, a, a passage in passing, I like to include it up there so that you can write it down and look it up for yourselves if you like to. That's why there's so much up there. But, but Jesus directs the activities of the church where he's supposed to. Again, thinking about our flesh and body, what the various members of our bodies do. If our legs take us for a walk, if our hands prepare a meal, they do these things because the head is conceded and directed them to do so. That's so always to be in the church. We do what we do as the church, as a collective, because Jesus has directed us to. And as a church, we do only what Jesus has directed us to. In Ephesians chapter 5, there Paul notes that, well, he also notes that that 
yes, that Christ is the head of the church. But he also goes on to note that because of this, the church is subject to Christ. And literally the phrase subject to has to do with being obedient to Christ. The church is expected to be obedient to Christ. Obedience is going to involve doing what he authorizes. And only what he has authorized. Second John, John's second epistle, has only one chapter. In Second John 9, verse 9, Second John verse 9, John writes there that whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. And the word transgress there literally carries with the idea of going too far. We might say doing too much. There is a sense in which we can do too much if what we are doing has not been authorized by our head. The church belongs to the Lord. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 tells us that he bought it. Like a friend of mine once said, he purchased the naming rights. He purchased everything pertaining to the church. He belonged to him because he bought it with his blood. And of course, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus himself described it as his church. Remember what he said? Upon this rock, I will build my church. It's his. And if it is his, if he bought it, he alone has the right to say what it ought to be used for, what it ought to be doing. The church exists to serve the designs and the purposes of the head. And again, we learn what those purposes and designs are by looking to his New Testament. What I'm afraid we find when we look at the written word is that there are many churches today who are serving the purposes and designs of their members rather than the purposes and designs of the Lord. <clears throat> I don't want to sound ugly or necessarily combative or needlessly combative, I guess I should say. But I believe many churches have gone very far afield when it comes to comparing them to the original design and purpose of the church as seen in the New Testament. Men have come up with their own purposes that they prefer for the church to serve. I've mentioned this before, but several years ago, I can't remember exactly, it was either four years or eight years ago, I know that, because it was a presidential candidate that I heard this from. But during one of the recent elections, presidential elections, I remember this candidate was being interviewed on TV. They later talked about the race. But, but in the course of the interview, the interviewer asked the candidate, how they felt about the mixing of religion and politics, and how they felt about candidates getting up in pulpits and in churches and at church services and delivering political speeches. And the candidate said that it actually made him sad to see this going on. He said it made him sad to see churches getting pulled into the political world and away from their true and original purpose. And my heart soared when he said that. And then he said he would like to see the churches get back to their true purpose. Providing social services in their communities. And my heart sank. <laughs> but to many, this is what the church is for. And because so many churches have accepted this for so long, to the neglect of what the Bible actually says the church is to do, what we find is knowledge of the Word of God is being lost in so many places throughout this land and in so many churches throughout this land. The knowledge of the Word of God is just not there. Because the church has gotten pulled into these other directions. Paul warned the Corinthian brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, do not think we don't know what is written. But nowadays most don't even know what's written. Over the years, many professing Christianity and membership of the Lord's church have done just what Paul said not to do. They've thought beyond what is written and they've taken the works, uh, they've taken the own works that and the thing known as the church that the head has never authorized, has never said that he wanted done by the church. I can read about the church in the New Testament being all about 
the spreading of the gospel and the spreading of the truth. And then in uh, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, all described the church there as the pillar and ground or support of the truth. The church is all about supporting the truth and seeing to it that it's taught. Therefore, in Acts chapter 13, we see the church at Antioch sending out men to preach the gospel. I can read how that the church exists for the edification of its members. All of the Thessalonian brethren to do this for one another, to build one another up in the faith. The Hebrew writer tells us within the church that we ought to be looking for ways to stir up one another to love and good works. I can see the church having a legitimate role in that. I can see the church with a legitimate role with regard to benevolence even. You know, 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1. Paul writes the collection that was being made for benevolent purposes. He refers to it again in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. But we should note that the benevolent action being taken by the churches as collective bodies, as churches at that time, were for the purpose of providing relief to needy saints, members, other members of the Lord's church. Now I do want to interject here that I am not saying that we don't have an obligation to those outside the body of Christ. Individual Christians certainly have an obligation to help others wherever possible. Paul did say in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 that as we have opportunity, we should do good to all, especially those who are in the household of faith. So he does make a distinction and say that yeah, we ought to be helping people outside the body as well. But the context of that statement indicates that it was a command given to individual believers. I have a responsibility in this regard. You have a responsibility in this regard. As a collective, as a church, though, that is outside the scope of our authority. See, the New Testament does make distinctions between certain responsibilities that are laid on the individual and certain responsibilities that are borne by the church as a collective body. And every time you read of the church collectively providing benevolence in the New Testament, it's, it's to believers. I cannot find in the Lord's New Testament where the church has provided general social services for the general public. And again, the Christian has a responsibility in this regard. God's laid that responsibility on us as individuals. We have no right as individuals to try to farm it out to the church. The New Testament does not speak of that going on. Similarly, I cannot find in the New Testament where the Lord has directed the church to provide recreational activities for either the general public or its members. Now, I believe such activities can be good things and even needful on a certain level at certain times. I think to Mark chapter 6, when it talks about how busy even the apostles have become, where they couldn't even take a meal because people were pressing on them so much. And Jesus told them in Mark 6 and verse 31 to, to come apart. He effectively tells them, take a break. Be refreshed. So recreation can be a good thing and even evil. It's not a scriptural work of the church, though. Nor is it a legitimate use, I believe, of the church's resources. Regarding those things that the Lord has directed the church to do, I think of Paul's words to Timothy again in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Another passage that's familiar to many in this audience. Remember what Paul says there? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scriptures provide guidance. The scriptures provide guidance with regard to every good work. Every good work. I heard Brother Hall, Brother Bill Hall, put it this way once. What that means is that if it is a good work that we're thinking about doing, we'll read about it in the scriptures. The question with regard to many of the works that many churches have taken on is that do the scriptures speak of them as good works for the church? Do the scriptures speak of them at all? As Jesus is the head of the church, the church should be taking its cue on what it ought to be doing from what he has said he wants it to do. All authority resides in him. Therefore, we should do all the what he says to do, but all that he says to do. These things are important. They're important.
important that you remember. Because of the last one that I want to share with you this morning. Regarding Jesus' designation as the head of the church. It is important for us to recognize the head's authority. And to demonstrate that recognition by acting in accordance with the direction he provides. Because otherwise the church can lose its relationship with its head. And there is no life without the head. Long time ago, well actually it still goes on in many parts of the world today, but a long time ago it was much more common to take a criminal and punish them, execute them, and put their head on a block, taking out a sword or an axe, and cutting off their hand. No, that's not what they cut off, is it? You can live without a hand. You can live without a foot. Not long after we were married, Tommy and I worshipped a man. His name was Jim Sullivan. He's put a soul in sense has gone on him. He had no legs. As a young man, he had legs, but as a young man, he once tried to jump on the wooden train. That's why he didn't have any legs when we met him. Yeah, he was faithful in his service. In his attendance at services, he was always there, one of the first there. I think it's so easy for you to see, but he was always there. He led public prayers. He engaged in public readings, doing all of this from the pew. Contributed to Bible classes. He even contributed an article for the bulletin there. At home, I once had to go to his home and see him there. I mean, he could get around really well, do a lot of work on his place. He had no legs. By the way, he had a wife and a couple of daughters. He had no legs. He could live without legs. We can live without certain members of our bodies. But in Matthew 18, remember what Jesus said there? That if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and catch it from you. You can live without one of those members. But what happens to the body when the head is cut off? The body dies. And really what we're talking about here is the possibility of the head cutting himself off if the body will not act in accordance with his wishes. In the book of Revelation, easy book to find, last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, in chapters 2 and 3, as the Lord has John sending messages to those churches, those seven churches of Asia, part of that message to some of those churches is that they're in danger of losing their relationship with their head, with him. With Jesus. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, for example. The church at Ephesus was warned of the possibility of the Lord removing their lampstand from his presence. If they didn't shave up, and I take that to mean that they would lose their relationship, their fellowship with him as a church. Are 
doing. And that's what we're trying to be all about as a church. I believe that's what we're trying to do here. I believe this is what this group here is trying to do. Now, as I always point out, I'm not trying to say that we've arrived and that we are where we need to be or that we, we've really just become a standard by anybody else who measures themselves. I'm not saying that at all. All of us as individuals continue to be works in progress, which means as a church we are a work in progress. But what I'm talking about, this is what we aspire to. This is what every church should aspire to. And we need to be reminded of that from time to time, I believe. And those who may be looking for a church need to be made aware that that's what we're aspiring to. And that if that's what they aspire to, we would love to have them join us. I hope that continues to be the aspiration of this church. Long after I'm gone, long after all of us are gone. That is what it's all about. Maintaining contact, maintaining fellowship with our head by acting in accordance with the thoughts of the kids of heart. Thank you for your attention this morning. So we take up the song, folks, and turn it